So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, January the 27th, the last Friday in January. Whew. So we're going to go right into February. This is episode number 193 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. We have a lot to cover today. And if you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description below and you'll see all the topics in order and some links. We have links this time because there's more information and we have an interesting shout out ahead too. So lots going on. Also, if you want to know how to submit your own question, please look down in the video description. There's a link to my main page, which is on thewaytobe.org and the pages also the way to be. There's a form you fill it out. You have to get past the little iron on patches and stuff like that. So these are the questions that were submitted over the past week. Let's jump right into them. The first question comes from Nancy Knowlton. Have you ever used spirulina pollen protein patties? Pros, cons, would you advise for or against using them? Okay, so spirulina. Spirulina I have tested, I have used it. It's microalgae and uh, it's widely available in the environment where I live. This is why the honeybees go to my pond and stuff like that. The spirulina patties I did get, I had a whole case of them. And the problem that I had with them, and maybe those of you who've tried them out yourselves can make comments down below, but they dried out too fast. They were like, yeah, they just, they were bricky and blocky and they didn't stay moist long enough for the bees to really use them. So when something's really dried out like that, uh, the bees didn't go for it. So the other thing is, I don't use a lot of protein patties in the first place inside my beehives. I like to offer things out free choice. So like, for example, spring's coming. And when spring gets here and the bees start flying out, I also don't put uh, pollen patties inside my hives. And I know there's fantastic proven pollen patties out there for your use. And if I were to put them in, if I were to put some kind of protein patty inside my hive, um, I would go in spring with the Hive Alive uh, protein pollen patties that are there to build brood specifically. Spirulina is not there to build brood. It's to balance out your bees diet. So diversity in the environment is key. And what I did was, so here's the spirulina that I've used. I haven't had to buy new packages of it, but I use the stuff that's set out for people. But you know what we're really buying? We're buying algae. And uh, I did this as part of one of my backyard tests where we want to give bees choices. You see, if we put out just one thing and it's mixed with sugar syrup, the bees are going to take it and we won't know what they would have taken on their own because we kind of gave them a single option. And bees, you know, anything that's loaded with sugar, they'll take it. So I put out sugar syrup, some with, some without, and uh, it's a great opportunity too if you've got other, you know, kind of appetite boosters that you're supposed to use in syrup. If you want to try it out, spirulina has been proven. I'm going to put a link down in the video description so you can see what it does for your bees, but more importantly, uh, where it's available. So in other words, if you have shallow water somewhere, we know even bird baths, when they get neglected, um, there'll be a bunch of uh, algae growing in it. So your bees actually are good at accessing this in the environment on their own. But just in case somebody's wondering how I put it together for my bees, I take a tablespoon of dry powder spirulina and I mix it with the four pounds of um, dry processed sugar. And I do it first. Mix it until that whole sugar collection in the bowl looks like it's uh, olive green because that's what it does. It turns everything green. And then... I add the water. If you do it after you've mixed your sugar syrup and dumped spirulina powder in there, you'll just get clumps. It doesn't blend very well. And then the other thing is I get lots of questions later about why are your bees green? What's wrong with them? Why do they have, you know, green driplets on their sides and things like that? Because uh, a lot of hornets and, and wasps like to go to it too. It's sugar, but it's also spirulina. So it's a dietary supplement 
you would classify it that way. But anyway, for those who want to read more, if you're looking into specifically the spirulina patties, I could only find one source that carries them. So you might think about it, and I don't want to, you know, undermine the seller of spirulina, but when there's a product, if it works really well, uh, they tend to be carried by a lot of different sources. And spirulina is being sold by Meyer Bees, M-E-Y-E-R Bees, and they sell it for $4.95 a patty at Myers at MeyerBees.com. So you can go and check it out. Look at the study. I mean, it does work. So again, my problem with it was that it dried out too fast. So maybe they've repackaged it. Maybe in the couple of years since I've used it, they also the bees did not consume a lot of it. But there again, they didn't consume a lot of anything that I put in there because they had lots of honey. They had their own protein in the form of pollen. And by the time um, spring came around, they were getting everything they needed from the environment. So I felt like as a backyard beekeeper, probably didn't need the uh, boost. So putting it out to see what they showed preferences for. They did go for the spirulina, but they didn't show that they had a preference for that over uh, other sugar syrup compositions. So it wasn't a standout. But there again, I should probably redo these tests at different times of the year just to see what they prefer. But remember, it's not sold as an appetite stimulant. It's kind of sold as a dietary supplement that makes sure that your bees get all that they need. But then that makes the assumption that they can't get all that they need from the environment. So feeding it in winter time, you're going to add more solids to the bee gut. More solids to the bee gut can be a problem. So we want them to have clear liquids, honey, and even honey, by the way. The darker the honey is, the more particulates are in it. And therefore, the harder it is on your bee's digestive system if they can't fly out and eliminate. So for extended long periods, another reason why I wouldn't put spirulina in my hive for winter. There are winter patties that are you know designed for that. Uh, but spirulina, it's okay. I don't see it as critical because they find it. Question number two comes from Frederick Jackson in Tennessee. I'm a new beekeeper getting a nuke from a local provider in April. They will be Italian and Carney hybrid. So Carney is short for Carniolan. And I'm putting them in a eight frame deep. Would you recommend adding a Varroa extended release treatment at the time of install as a prevention without a mite check? From what I understand, the nuke will probably have Varroa mites. Any suggestion on that? What might control protocol to use or product? So here's the thing. And I know that a lot of you watching right now are headed into your very first year with bees. So you've probably already ordered packages and things like that. Some people will collect swarms, but what I'm about to tell you works on both of those. What I'm about to tell you does not work if you're getting a, a uh, nucleus hive. So if you get a nucleus, your bees are there. They've already got all stages of Varroa and some are capped and some are not available for other treatments. So this is for those who are getting a package or a swarm. Because a package or a swarm, they don't have comb, they don't have brood, and they're not building up yet. So when you receive those, mark that receiving date when you put them inside your hive. And on the eighth day, you want to give them an oxalic acid vaporization treatment. The reason for that is past the eighth day, and we left ourselves a safe margin of error there, like it might rain, so you might be doing the ninth day. You want to get that treatment in there before they hit the pupa state and they're capped over, and therefore the treatment, if it's oxalic acid vaporization, will not reach the mites. And you also don't want to treat right away when you get them because they're kind of disheveled. When you get a package or a, a swarm, uh, you're trying to win them over and get them to stay in the box that you've put them in, and if you add stressors, like an oxalic acid vaporization treatment is a stressor for the bees if they're brand new or if you've just introduced a queen, they could associate that behavior with either the environment that they're in or with that new queen and either reject the queen or they could potentially reject the hive that you put them in thinking oxalic acid vaporization just came along with it and they're out of there. That's why we wait long enough for them to let the queen start laying and then she'll have some eggs in there that have some brood started. Then they're less prone to fly away by the time that eighth day rolls around when you give them the treatment. Now, when it comes to a package, so if there's a nuke from a local provider 
And it says that I know that they come probably loaded with Varroa mites. I would have to ask that question of the provider. Why isn't the seller of those nucleus hives keeping those Varroa under control? If I were buying a nucleus, which is a micro beehive, it's complete, it's ready to go, it's got a queen, she's laying, a lot of those are her offspring. So it's a complete colony already. I would expect the responsible seller to have those Varroa mites under control for you. If the reputation is that they come preloaded with Varroa destructor mites and small hive beetles and things like that, and I get those emails from people, and why don't I share that information with you? Because it's secondhand information. So I'm not going to recycle uh, claims and complaints and you know people that are very upset about packages or nucleus colonies, which are more expensive, uh, that come preloaded with a bunch of pests. So that's part of the reputation of the seller. So I would go to the seller and ask them to make sure that those mites are under control before you take possession of the package. That's what I have to say about that. Question number three comes from Tyler Irwin, PA. I'm interested in becoming a beekeeper this spring and I've been researching swarm prevention methods as I reside in a suburban neighborhood. I don't want to annoy my neighbors with bivouacs and or new colonies built inside their houses. I understand that splits are the best way to prevent swarms, but don't have the resources or space to have many hives. So what's your recommended method to prevent swarms without creating new colonies? Okay, this is for Tyler and anybody else who's living in an urban setting where you have neighbors all around you. You cannot guarantee anyone that their colonies won't split. The reason is that's normal reproduction for the beehive. That's what they're trying to do. So I would, as a mentor, be irresponsible if I told someone that I have that nailed down. I guarantee you're not going to have a colony that splits. I guess no one can do that. I mean, we all, you can do all the right things. You can relieve congestion by adding a box. You can isolate your queen and create a brood break and then put them all back together. You can add ventilation. You can uh, do all the correct things and then the bees will do what they're biologically designed to do and that's reproduce on an individual level. That's what's going on in the brood frames and they reproduce as a super organism, which is why they're even here today. Their ability to swarm and produce another entire colony of bees is why they exist. That's how they spread out. And some lines of bees do that more frequently than others, and they're more sensitive. So I can't guarantee that. So now what I'm saying is going to be unpopular for a lot of people. If you live in an urban area and you've got a restriction, or you've got neighbors that you're trying to keep your hives a secret from. Some people don't want bees around. And there may even be uh, already established ordinances that restrict owning agricultural animals. So they're considered farm animals under a lot of jurisdictions. So if you have any kind of restriction and you're trying to operate kind of under the radar, it may become impossible for you to do that. So for those who can't keep bees, and because we can't guarantee that they're not going to swarm, Somebody else may say, well, you could clip the queen's wings on one side. So you mark your queen, you clip her wings, and some sellers will give you a queen that's already marked. Now, does that keep the queen from flying away with your bees? Yes. She'll fly out and land in the yard somewhere. <clears throat> However, the reason she's flying out is because your bees are producing queens, usually more than one. So how vigilant are you going to be to make sure that you don't produce secondary queens because she's still going to leave, even with clipped wings, they're still going to replace her, and then you have the potential to run multiple swarms. They're called after swarms, and even virgin queens can fly out with a bunch of bees from your colony and end up in your neighbor's overhang somewhere, getting into their attic. And just as you mentioned, uh, your neighbors don't want bees inside their crawl spaces and stuff like that. So... 
it's a great opportunity also to put the word out to your neighbors and stuff to make sure that they've, you know, tuck pointed and sealed everything up and looked at their soffits and looked at their crawl spaces and made sure that not only bees don't get in there, but that hornets, you know, wasps and things like that aren't getting in there and making paper nests. So you could actually hide the fact that you have bees by telling them you're concerned about wasps and yellow jackets moving in and you want to make sure you kind of look over their houses with them and say oh look there's openings you could you could seal that up you could rtv that you could replace that damaged soffit things like that so you could help your neighbors protect themselves from wasps and then in turn they would also be preventing the entrance of uh, honeybees around electrical boxes conduit entrances and things like that any place where a scout honeybee would see some contrast, find an opening and explore that to see if they could move into it. But back to the original question, I can't guarantee any method that would prevent your bees from swarming. You can expand your boxes, you can do everything you want, and take it from me, from personal experience, that they will swarm. So, if you're in an area where that's not allowed, or you get yourself in a pickle over it, I wouldn't keep bees. Instead, I would just provide... Uh, resources for pollinators in general and enjoy the bees that come to your yard so question number four comes from dick from los altos california hi fred my question is regarding how to know when to reuse old drawn comb specifically i have some frames with very dark brown comb from a colony that failed i assume it's likely that this was brood comb i think it's about two years old What's your opinion about using these frames for a new colony this spring? I've been keeping bees for about seven years and I have two hives. Well, I'm so glad you've been keeping bees for seven years because you've already beat the averages there. And the thing is, so this just comes into the discussion about rotating out old comb. Um, comb that's five years old, this is kind of a standard benchmark. You're going to hear people that keep their comb much longer than that, but I'm just going to explain the backyard beekeeper kind of rhythm of it. I pull 20% of the frames, the oldest frames, every five years. So in other words, you'll start removing them at the fifth year and you go with the darkest two frames. So take out two out of 10 and then just cycle out your oldest brood frames as you go forward. So 20% of your frames every year. And then uh, the other thing is you can take those old frames and that old brood comb and that makes an outstanding uh, swarm trap. Better than any swarm lure you're going to get. Swarm lure you're going to get. So old comb, especially brood comb, that you use inside a hive that's designed as a bait hive to trap a swarm, that's going to be the most appealing thing and it's going to draw scouts right away. If you don't have that stuff and you're trying to draw scouts to a trap or something like that, scrapings from your hive, burr comb, and scrapings of the propolis, anything that makes it smell like it's been lived in by bees before. Now, it's valuable. So the other thing is, you know, why did those bees die? If you're 99.9% .9 sure it was not a brood disease, and uh, the most threatening brood diseases would be American fowl brood or European fowl brood because it persists in the comb and can stay there for decades. So if you're sure that it wasn't, you know, like it was a queen loss or they starved or something like that, keep the comb and use it. Some people may be thinking, They'd like to have drawn comb and they want to start out with that to give the bees a boost and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, here's an example of comb that helps your bees when they're starting but would not be suitable for uh, swarm lure, for example. So it's called better comb. I haven't mentioned this for a long time. It's a synthetic pre-drawn beeswax comb. Uh, the only difference is it's not made by bees. Bio, you know, biochemists got together and they uh, copied beeswax by composition and the only thing different is it's not made by bees, but it behaves like beeswax in every other way and uh, does not have the scent of having been used before, but it can give them a boost, meaning they don't have to draw out fresh comb to get started and the bees will start to work it. And once they've worked it for a while and they've stored resources, honey or nectar or something in it, then uh, they'll be building their own brood comb next to it. So I recommend, you know, checkerboarding that a full frame of drawn comb and then an empty frame and a full frame of drawn comb and an empty frame and that way they'll draw them out and it will be nice and straight assuming your hives are level side to side perfectly level they can be tipped towards the landing board not too much though and uh, then you'll have good comb so 
20% <clears throat> starting in your fifth year, I would be rotating out my oldest, darkest, most used comb. And that's just me. And the reason is because uh, residue builds up in them and, uh, and I'm talking about pesticide residue. So, and that can come from agricultural practices and things like that. It really is not worth uh, taking that comb and mailing it off to a lab for analysis just to find out how many pesticides are present in the comb. There has not been, you know, clean comb found. So it's, it, it all has residue in it. The question is how much the concentration is. I don't know of a place in the United States anywhere where you're totally free from agricultural pesticide residue in the honeycomb. Uh, there was a grad student at Penn State that was doing studies and everybody sent comb in, everybody sent honey in and things like that. None of it was clean, no matter where you lived. So very interesting stuff, but rotate it out on the fifth year starting because I'd like to keep it at least for five years. I wouldn't start pulling comb right away. Uh, so question number five comes from David in Amarillo, Texas. Our bee club got a call about a beehive in a tree. I asked the property owner to send me a pic, assuming the bees were inside a hollow tree. The pic he sent showed an open air hive of eight or more dinner plate sized combs hanging on the bare branches of an oak tree. That's very cool to see, by the way. And this was the second time our club has seen this kind of hive in the past few months. Why would bees do this, is my question. We assume they started out as a swarm, but failed to locate a suitable cavity. Or maybe the scouts just took too long and the workers started building comb and the queen started laying. It's just weird. If I could figure out how to send a pic, I would. Thanks. Okay, so David did send pictures. And uh, this is something that we've seen even up here in the state of Pennsylvania, even the president of our beekeepers association had these open comb of uh, beeswax with the bees on it, hanging on a tree branch and didn't even notice it until fall hit and the leaves all fell off the tree and here they were. But of course they died from exposure. So the thing is, all of the things that uh, David speculated on could be true because we know that when they spend an excessive amount of time on a single branch, you'll find uh, beeswax residue on that. They are starting to build on it. So they do that when they can't find a suitable place to go. They also, with that queen, will not return to the colony that they departed from. So they're in a jam. And the thing is, if uh, for those of you who study the Africanized bees, so that African bee line, initially, they don't build in cavities at all. So they're from warm climates and they're super defensive. As we all know, everybody knows that Africanized bees are defensive. They're prone to build their comb in the open and just defend it extremely well. And they can get away with it if they're in a climate that does not get you know, extended freezing periods of time. They just glom all over it and they defend that area and the comb doesn't get robbed, which is really interesting considering our bees have difficulty defending a colony when the entrance is four inches wide. So these are fully exposed and it does happen. Now, is it happening more often? I don't know, but it's very cool looking. I like it. You know, I, I would collect those. Yeah. So the feral comb, there's so much that you can learn from it. But uh, yeah, it's the reason they do it. They get stuck and they start building. They've even tried here, but they don't last long. They don't even get like one little paddle going before... Um, they're just robbed and completely messed up. But that's because those genetics of that colony that started that are not the super defensive uh, Africanized genetics. So I suppose for David, another part of the question would be, were they super defensive too? How were they? But yep, it happens. And once they start the comb, if they start laying eggs, they stick with it no matter what happens. And it is amazing. But up here, they just... You know, as soon as the weather turns cold, they die out. Question number six comes from JC. Sweetwater, Tennessee. This April will be one year anniversary of beekeeping. We've had a few warm days and two hives I have are still very much active and alive. I'm looking toward the spring and splits. I have them in two APMA hives and have two more ready for the spring to put splits in. Would you recommend splitting by artificial swarm method? 
moving the old queen into the new hives and allowing the original colony to requeen, or do you have a more preferred method? I'm not solely interested in a massive honey crop and just want to slightly increase my yard just as I enjoy learning about apiculture. Okay, that's exactly how I make mine. And, you know, we just call them walk-away splits. You know, you make your split, but you have to assess colony strength and you want to do it at the right time. So this kind of falls back on an earlier question about how to prevent swarms. But uh, the person that wanted to prevent swarms didn't want to make splits and create more colonies of bees. So if you do want to do that, as described here, it's very easy. When I do an inspection in spring, because the buildup happens so fast, usually coincidental with your fields filling up with dandelions. There are other things that stimulate, you know, a strong nectar flow, pollen flow, uh, all the resources are boosted and your bees are ahead of the game because they're actually building their numbers, which means 21 days before that even happened, the queen was increasing her lay rate and that's why we have this buildup and the potential for swarming. So that's the sweet spot you wanna find is when I have five good frames of comb, uh, if there's five frames of almost all capped brood, that's a prime split. So I would pull three of those covered frames with the bees on them and with the brood of all ages and with the queen, so find the queen and I would move her and those bees right into your new colony, into your new hive. And I would leave the two frames of brood um, behind with plenty of pollen, so a frame of pollen, and then other resources, move them to the center, and then put your, because you're gonna have to put new frames in to replace those that you're taking out. So you need to have those ready to go, but those go on the outside and your brood and existing frames get all pushed together in the middle. So, and it works extremely well. I've had that work nine times out of 10. I know the statistics on doing a walkaway split overall uh, reported by others seems to be much lower than that success wise. And the thing is, if you inspect them in three weeks and you do not see uh, evidence that they produce a new queen in the hive that you pulled them from, then the hive that is producing eggs that has those resources, you pull one frame of that and you run it right back to the original hive that you took the queen out of and then give them another chance to start another queen from the eggs that you've put back in there. So these are insurance policies and also why I have nucleus uh, hives now that become my resources for any queenless colony in my apiary. Just pull a frame of eggs and add it to them. But if you wait too long, and the reason I bring this up is because we're doing walk away splits. Walk away doesn't mean ignore them forever. You have to do this inspection within three weeks. Uh, and look for evidence that they're, they've produced another queen. They'll generally do multiples. But if you find them queenless, if you wait till after the third week, that's when the laying workers start kicking in. Their ovaries are activated and they're laying eggs. So two to three weeks is your sweet spot for finding out. And then, of course, boosting them with eggs and open larvae, which, again, suppress those hormones that cause those females to start laying as workers, which is bad news for you they're only going to lay drones and be resistant to new queens. So to me, that's the easiest way to do it. I like it. It's a lot of fun. And your spring time is the best time to do it. When do I decide to do splits like that, aside from the buildups that are going on? I look to see if there's a lot of drones around. Because if they produce drones and I see those drones outside the hive coming and going, then I know that if I produce a virgin queen this time of year, I'm producing from overwintered stock. And I know that people have not received their packages and their nukes and things that they buy in, that they ship in from other areas. So those new queens will be flying out to the drone congregation areas and they'll be mating with the stock from other colonies that have also survived winter in my climate. That's why I don't want to wait to do that kind of thing until midsummer or the end of the year, for example, because then we could be using drones that are from packages that were flown in from wherever or a nuke from the hive that was uh, talked about earlier where they came preloaded with varroa mites and things like that. Question number seven comes from Beth, Vermilion, Ohio. Can you talk about Nozema? I peeked in one of my hives and saw bee poo all over the mountain camp sugar. Uh, it was also on top of the frames and outer cover. I changed their sugar but that's all I'm aware I can do at this time of year. 
If the hive dies, can I use old boxes and frames? And if they live, just give them hive alive and sugar water for spring. Okay, so the very first thing I'm gonna say about this, first of all, uh, dysentery like that, when they have diarrhea, I mean, it's just like they ate four bran muffins and they have a double hit of coffee and all of a sudden there's an accident on the highway and they can't leave. They're stuck in their car. Terrible scenario. So what happened is your bees are getting either too much liquid, they are getting too many solids uh, that they're feeding on, and they did not get cleansing flights in time. So they're stuck inside and it's too cold to fly out, so they end up eliminating inside. Now that can be partnered with nosema, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have nosema. So uh, the nosema bacteria is a whole nother thing. They can have that without having uh, dysentery. So let's take the dysentery by itself. Either too much liquid, uh, they're in a really wet area. So for example, a lot of people had a lot of rain this year. Some people have situated their beehives in areas that stay wet. So if you're in a low area, if there's ponding water in the yard and things like that, or it's an area that's prone to flooding, it's time to move your hives to higher ground, drier ground. So there are a lot of things that contribute to that. Does it mean that you can't use the frames or that there's, you know, that's a disease that's going to carry over? Not necessarily, because that's not a brood disease. This is digestive problems. So the thing here was, uh, one of the things I would do, because this is in Vermilion, Ohio, if you don't have them already, get Hive Alive Fondant Packs. And uh, everyone I know across the board that's using them is showing great success with them. Uh, because there is Hive Alive liquid syrup in that. It's not a complete dose. But the Hive Alive Fondant material is going to help your bees not have dysentery. So they're going to get a bigger bang for their buck with a really high concentration of sugar and resources without overloading them with a bunch of solids that cause them to have to do cleansing flights. So that's one thing. I would not put liquid syrup on a hive in the wintertime. That includes ProSweet. In the past, I've thought the ProSweet looks so much like honey uh, and it's so dense that it's probably okay to give your bees in the wintertime. But... Uh, Unless you're keeping that topped off absolutely full, you run the risk of creating an airspace inside that inverted drinker and uh, having a warm-up day expand and express that right down into your hive and it will be cold stuff. So dry feeding, so the most dampness or the wettest feed I would put on in wintertime would be one of the winter protein patties or a regular winter patty they're called. Um, even uh, Man Lake sells winter patties. They're just uh, like fondant. And then there's the fondant from Hive Alive, which I just across the board endorse that stuff. And they're all running about the same in pricing. So they are, you know, around $5 a pack. And a lot of uh, beekeepers on YouTube and elsewhere, are they have discount links for Hive Alive fondant. I do too. On my website, I've got a Hive Alive page where it also has the interview I did with the owner of Hive Alive, uh, Dara Scott, and uh, where he explains, you know, what's in it, how it works. So, and the reason I bring that up is last winter was my first winter with Hive Alive Fondant. I have beehives that uh, get dysentery, that it's the brown, I, now I didn't see it inside the hive on the frames as described here, but it makes sense that they would be up in your dry sugar and leave brown stains in the dry sugar. That's fairly common. Also, people use the mountain camp method, which is just newspaper with dry sugar poured on it, and the bees get in there, and as they consume that, you'll see brown and tan stains in the sugar. Not the end of the world. You'll see cleansing flights on these warmer days when the sun shines, and uh, it's interesting to me because I see cleansing flights and they're not turning the snow tan. Historically, we would see cleansing flights and we would see little tan amber colored dabs in the snow where your bee landed in the snow and then eliminated its contents from its gut. So the Hive Alive fondant pack colonies had much less of the brown staining in front of the hive in the snow 
and much less of the brown staining on the front of the hive and on the landing board. So my question for Beth is, are you using Hive Alive fondant? It says change their sugar. So sugar isn't cheap. So we know that that fondant pack is five bucks. Not only that, um, they consume it easier than the sugar. And I've had this discussion with a couple of people recently, the dry sugar, uh, which provides a really high concentration of sucrose. We know that it also provides a place for the condensation inside your hive to solidify the sugar. And then the bees also have to use that uh, condensation to liquefy the sugar. And uh, so there's a lot of physical work around uh, collecting the sucrose in the form of sugar when it's dry like that, or a sugar brick or a sugar block. And so there's a happy medium between dry sugar feed and liquid feed, which we should not give in winter unless it's honey in the comb. And so in between that would be fondant, which really is kind of, it, it feels liquid all the time, but it's not gonna run down in the hive. It's gonna give them maximum nutrition with minimal material in the bee. Bees can gain 30% of their body weight just holding waste material on board and uh, they can do that for months. So we really want them to be able to get out and do a cleansing fight ahead of time. But I did notice, but that was just one year. So it's a one-off for me. But this year, they all have um, Hive Life fondant on them. And one of those colonies has brown spots on the front of the hive. And it does have Hive Alive on it. But overall, I've seen a reduction in uh, those that are eliminating brown or colored waste material on the front of the hive, the landing board, or immediately in front of the hive in the snow. So for those that are using it, I would love to hear from you. If you're using um, that fondant this year uh, and you see a reduction in dysentery from your bees, uh, I'd like to hear about that because I want to know, is that happening everywhere? Or is it just here in like Pennsylvania? Uh, because in southern states, they don't have these problems because they can get out and fly. There's at least a couple days a week that they can get out and do cleansing flights and eliminate their hind guts. So uh, we're in a different problem here. So I hope some of that was helpful, but it's not necessarily an indicator of nosema. It could be a partner with that issue that's going on, but nosema acts on them in a much uh, different way. And also uh, nosema can be dealt with with I have a life, so. And with the new studies with the pollen from sunflowers, which we can't do anything about this time of year. But for those of you who are thinking about what am I gonna plant this year that's gonna help my bees, look at sunflowers that are loaded with pollen. And uh, I haven't seen a specific study. They did name some of the sunflowers. We have several varieties of sunflower here, and I've been planting them for years. And my mite loads are low, historically low here in my treatments. My only treatments are oxalic acid vaporization. And I'm starting to wonder if I don't have some kind of compound benefit with the way I'm keeping the bees, the integrated pest management that I use, the environmental resources, acres of sunflowers. Uh, so the diversity of forage and everything else maybe are all contributing to the overall health and well-being of my colonies of bees and I'm cycling back my own bees in this area in the way that we described earlier with the walkaway split. We're getting bees that are acclimated to our area that demonstrate hardiness in this zone. I'm ag zone four. Uh, so I'm even colder than Erie PA. I'm 1300 feet above sea level. Erie PA is at 500 feet above sea level. So our climates are different. Uh, so I have bees here that through the years are demonstrating greater hardiness and they're matching the environmental rhythm of where we live, when things bloom, when things recede. And for those of you who want to know if you're living in an area that has a dearth or that has a lot of resources, the website is called Beescape, B-E-E-S-C-A-P-E dot -E -E org and you put in your address there, and this is only unfortunately for people that are in the United States, and you can find out uh, what your environment looks like as far as pesticide loads and everything else. But apparently I'm in a sweet spot. And so I could have contributing factors that I'm even unaware of as to why my bees are also managing their varroa mite numbers very well. So things are different everywhere. Question number eight comes from Kay in Maryland. Why wouldn't I just use a 10 frame box 
with a follower board instead of a nuke. Then the collie would not be disturbed and I can just add frames as needed. So what Kay is describing is exactly what I used to do. I did it all the time. If I caught a swarm, if I made a split, I put them straight in a deep eight frame box or a deep 10 frame box. Whatever I had handy, I just plunked them in there. In fact, for years, I wanted to keep my bees that way for the reasons described. If you put them in that hive, that's where they're going to be. And so people that get a nucleus hive, for example, they bought it from somewhere. It's a four frame nuke. It's a five frame nuke. I told them, bring it straight home, stick it straight in your 10 frame box or your eight frame deep, whichever you happen to have. And that's the final gear and the final position that they're going to be in. Makes perfect sense. Worked great, by the way. So even follower boards, for those of you who don't know, it's just a solid board that gives the bees the impression that the space that they're in is much smaller than it is. So eight or 10 frames could feel like three or four frames, depending on where you put the follower boards. And then you have your extra frames outside of that and the bees don't have access to it. So smaller spaces, bees do better. Now, so you can, you can do exactly that. Now I highly recommend you don't make that divider board. Let's call it that instead of a follower board because follower boards are usually with the horizontal hives like the long lang or the lay-ins. But um, if you put it in there, don't let that be rigid foam board or polystyrene or something like that because your bees will and can chew it. And uh, so that's kind of bad. Feels like it insulates okay, but I would rather see you make that out of three quarter inch plywood. It is inside the hive, so it doesn't have to be weatherproof or anything. And uh, just make it like a, a standard beehive frame that would it be this size, but the whole, use this as a pattern, cut this whole thing out of wood and make it so your bees can't get past it and put that on either side and then you put your three or four frames in the middle. Yes, you can do it. So why did I change though? Because I kind of went the other way. I don't look at my nucleus hives, which are the five frame deeps. I don't look at those as temporary anymore. Those for me have become beehives year round. They're out there right now, as cold as it is. And they're out there without supplemental feed, without any other care other than what they build up in winter. There are 15 deep frames because I have them three high. And uh, this is the second year that they are just buzzing away in there. They have their own honey. They have their own resources. There's no feeder. It's not set up for a feeder at all. Now, we are going to have a design that allows for them to be fed and a tray underneath and integrated pest management and everything else. But I'm looking more at keeping those as regular hives. They're not just going to be a temporary nucleus configuration. It's just going to be a five frame beehive. So, and why am I doing that? Because they work extremely well. And uh, every time I listen to something that Dr. Thomas Seal is talking about with his uh, adaptive beekeeping or bee centric beekeeping or the Darwinian beekeeping method, whatever you want to call it. Um, he describes the optimum box that gets the space that is selected by your bees as the equivalent of a 10 frame deep box, a single box. And uh, so if I have 15, if I have three five frame nukes stacked over each other, I'm already bigger than that. By Dr. Seely, it would be just two of those, but I do three because they store so much honey. And why do I have three? Because I take that honey away and I put it in other colonies that are falling behind at the end of the year. Instead of heavily feeding them with two to one syrup or something like that, I can rob my nucleus resource hives. And guess what they do? They replace it extremely fast. So what I've learned is, and a lot of other people I'm sure know this too, this isn't like unique knowledge. Uh, and probably who knows, more and more I find out that people 100 years ago or 200 years ago knew the same stuff and we all think it's new because we just noticed it because we're a little slow on the uptake, me specifically. Uh, so the five frame nukes are great hives. I just stack them up and I don't put them in larger groups than four together. So four side by side spread out because someone else did a study that the bees can count to four and like they can find their hives immediately or if there's just four. But if there are five, six, and seven in a row that now they drift more than they did when they were just four. So, and I know somebody's going to say, where's that study? And I have to say, I, I've been trying to find it and I can't anymore, but I limit mine to four and I space them out. Um, so yes, you can do that. I know I gave a lengthy explanation, but I'm liking the five frame 
nucleus size hive. So I might stop calling it a nucleus altogether, even though it's a nucleus box. If you go to my website, thewaytobe.org, and you look at the uh, page that's marked prints or plants, they're absolutely free. So when we have a concept like this that's working, whether it's a long Langstroth hive, whether it's how I configure my um, standard Langstroth hives today, the most successful configuration here in my climate in Pennsylvania, uh, we put those prints in there and uh, Ross Millard updates the prints when we find a, a better feature of a hive that works better where I live. So these uh, nucleus hives with uh, the features that work the best here and what I'm shifting to, those prints are there and you can download them. It's a PDF. You can print them. You can make your own because it's all about sharing the information. But I'm looking at nucleus resource hives as actual hives full time year round. They work. Question number nine comes from Danny from West Richland, West Virginia. <clears throat> And it says, after watching your last podcast, 192E, which is the extended version because something happened and it uploaded partial, I thought of maybe creating a long lang on a slope, perhaps 25 to 30 degrees, with frames still in a vertical configuration, so overwintering your bees may act like a vertical hive and allow the bees to migrate to warmer parts of the long hive. Thoughts? Thanks in advance. I have good news for Danny from West Richland. Because here's the thing. I think that hive already exists. So that's going to be my shout out for today. So get your pencils ready and I hope you go to this website. Well, it's a YouTube channel. I think there may be an associated website, but I knew I'd seen this before because I came across it a couple of years ago. It's a long Langstroth hive that's up on a tilt and they mounted it onto a post and it swivels around and goes all these different directions. But I think it's solving the problems that Danny's talking about. The hive is called Colony Keeper Hive. It's designed by a man named Mark Waring, M-A-R-K-W-A-R-I-N-G, and he's from Massachusetts. When you watch his video, you're going to listen to an authentic Massachusetts accent which I have lots of relatives from Boston. I love the way they talk. Mark talks that way. What's the name of Mark's YouTube channel so that you can check out his hive? His YouTube channel is called Mark Waring. M-A-R-K space W-A-R-I-N-G. So I'm gonna put a link down in the video description below for question number nine, leading you right to his explanation on this beehive. So tell me, Danny, if this does not match what you were thinking about, I think he's already on it. I also think it, uh, someone said that it's part of his Master Beekeeper project and that a lot of people are using it, testing it. And I think the most recent update on his channel is six months ago. So that's not too bad. And maybe we can get him to talk more about it. But uh, it's already called the Colony Keeper Hive. Check it out. Let me know what you think. For those of you who have seen that before or know about it, Put a comment down in the video description and let us know uh, how it's working, what you thought, what are the drawbacks. Would I personally, am I, you know, do I think I personally would use that? I've gone kind of the other route. So with the horizontal configuration with uh, the long lang, for example, or the lands hives and things like that, I'm going to leave them the way they are. And all I did this year was boost insulation directly above the frame. So above the cover boards on the long lang more insulation, no airflow through the top. Their winter performance so far has been the best it's been since I started using the Long Langstroth and the Layens Hive, same thing. Both of those got extra insulation on top and I've left that configuration now. If that fails again and it doesn't work well and they have a bunch of resources that they couldn't get to, I may consider something else. But for right now, um, I'm not looking at tipping something up like that. But uh, for those of you who have done it or are interested in it, uh, I look forward to hearing more about it. And I did leave a comment on his YouTube today, uh, letting him know I was going to send people his way and uh, just I wish him well. It's a very, it's a very involved looking system there, so I hope it works. The next question, number 10, comes from Donna 
from Maryland. Question about drones and green drone frames. But first, I wanted to say how much I enjoy your Q&A sessions. Usually I leave that out, but thank you so much for um, enjoying my stuff. It says that drone frames for IPM, IPM for those who don't know is integrated pest management. And by pest, we're talking about small hive beetles and we're talking about varroa destructor mites. We want to get those under control by the way we configure a hive or the way that we manage them in non-chemical ways. So do they cause the colony to build more drones than they normally would or do they simply direct the colony to place the majority of drones on those frames? I ask because most colonies are composed of 20% drones naturally, I believe. That is true, 15 to 20%. And this is the frame that we're talking about. This is green so that it stands out when you're looking at your hive and the imprint on the bottom, the embossing, and this is heavy wax. This is an acorn version and uh, the cells are sized for drones. So your bees naturally draw cells that are bigger than they would be for worker bees. And they use it also for nectar storage and pollen storage and things like that. But when they build cells for uh, reproduction on those green frames, I've never seen workers uh, develop there. So they're always drones. So anyway, moving on, they use green frames. Is that the beekeepers needs to be punctual in removing it or be in danger of creating a mite bomb? Okay, so I'll, I'll read the rest of it and then I'll give you my comments. But is that really the case? If one is not using a drone frame, the drones and associated mites are scattered throughout the colony and the beekeeper is not removing those drones and they're not being accused of creating mite bombs. If a drone frame doesn't create more drones but simply places them all in one convenient spot, it seems the mite bomb comments aren't quite correct. Of course, they aren't an effective IPM if you're not removing them, but I just wonder if forgotten frames are as horrible as they are made out to be. Um, so it says, by the way, I do use the green drone frames for IPM after the spring buildup. In the, last, in the past, I did simply place a medium frame among the deeps and would regularly cut the drone comb from the bottom. While I admit I enjoyed placing the comb out on the porch and watching a variety of birds Coming by to partake in the feast, I hated that the bees had to spend so much time making that comb. Now I pull the green frame when it's fully capped, freeze it, run an uncapping roller over it, and before placing it back in the colony where the bees will clean out the dead larvae, but don't have to rebuild the honeycomb. Just my personal preference. So for Donna here, um, I don't think I agree. By the way, I don't think that people who forget to pull these out, they're not creating a mite bomb or a mite breeding colony, for example. The reason that we stress it is, in other words, why buy these frames? Um, and that's so that you'll know exactly where they are at a glance. And if you're doing hundreds of hives and you're whipping through there, you look and you're pulling drone frames, which I think most commercial keepers may not be using this because it's labor intensive. You have to mark your calendar. So we know that uh, if you're going to use it for integrated pest management, it uh, is attractive to Varroa destructor mites. Varroa destructor mites pick their targets based on pheromones, by the way. And the pheromone that comes off of an egg that's for a male bee, the drone, is different from that of the worker. And uh, because it's more successful reproduction in the Varroa destructor mite in these combs, in the drone comb, then uh, they naturally um, have adapted to seeking out drone sized cells because they get a couple of reproduction cycles out of that where with a worker cell they'd only get one reproduction cycle. And then there are also people uh, who say that well if they're only in the worker then the drone numbers should never increase because they're only doing one reproduction cycle. And to that I say the drone, I mean not the drone, but the Varroa destructor might lives longer than one reproductive cycle. So in other words, so one foundress mite gets in there and produces, let's say just one other female mite and out they both come when the uh, worker bee emerges. Then that means there's two of them now and now two of them enter and they're each producing one each. And then they each, so now there's four of them 
and then they each produce one each. So you see what I'm saying? Because they don't die after one cycle, the numbers do increase. They increase more because they get two cycles out of drone cum. So that's what we're talking about. And that's why this became a thing long ago, where if you set the drone comb, once it's capped, uh, then we know that the mites have entered because the mites scoot in there just before they enter the pupa phase. And uh, so when they're capped, the mites are trapped. We got them. And that's where you can pull these frames out and uh, set them out for your chickens. If you can train your chickens to do anything. So you train your chickens that this is where the food is. You don't even have to uncap them. You just put it out there and they run over and start picking them out right away. One chicken picks out one developing drone and all the other chickens start doing it too. They are a chicken see, chicken do kind of thing. So it works really well. And the reason that, uh, I don't think it, it's not a mite bomb if you forget to do that. You're just not using this method to control your mites anymore. So if you forget and your drones emerge from those cells and uh, all the little mites scoot out, then you miss your opportunity for that control measure. So there are other measures of control that still work. So you can still do that. You just lost uh, the idea that you did this because your bees took all their time to develop the drones, to feed the drones, and drones are heavy eaters. And of course, when they come out, they don't even fend for themselves. They have to be fed by nurse bees. So for everything that goes on inside a hive, developing drones is a sign of profound wealth on the, on the part of the beehive. That's why when you see a colony that's really strong, has a lot of drones coming and going on the landing board, and they're producing up to that 20%, so it's 15 to 20%. So 1.5 to two frames on a 10 frame box will be nothing but drones whether you use this green comb or not. So even if you put worker size comb in there, you'll see the drones on the outer cells or sometimes on the fringe, outer edges of brood frames, and you'll see them a lot along the bottoms and stuff. So they're always gonna be producing drones whether you use those green frames or not. The green frames allow you to concentrate them so you can pull them and as described, feed things with them. So I hope that makes sense. I don't consider people that forget and, you know, which happens, by the way, even with backyard beekeepers, they forget. Uh, that time frame goes by pretty fast and they pull out their drone frames and see half of them have already emerged. So they're too late on that. So the idea of freezing them, feeding them to birds, I am curious what kind of wild birds are eating that because I'm also taking a course right now in ornithology with uh, Cornell University, and it's just an online course. They're inexpensive, you do it at your own pace, you take lessons and stuff. I'd like to know more about birds, and uh, I'd like to know which birds are feeding on that. That would be a fantastic YouTube to see. Um, feeding the birds, then it wouldn't make you feel so bad about just pulling frames of drones, killing them, and getting rid of them. So if you're feeding your chickens, to get those $8 a dozen eggs right now, by the way, they're super expensive, we won't even talk about that, but we have our own flock of chickens, of course. But I'm interested in the wild birds that are uh, feeding off of those this time of year. Super interesting stuff. So thanks for that question. Question number 11. I don't know if I'm going to get this name right. Crayla from Waverly, Tennessee. Says, uh, I've set a stand with a pallet and steel fence post and concrete blocks. I wonder if I should spray the pallet with waterproof for longevity or if it's bad for bees. How about legs on the horizontal hive, etc. Okay, so could be a spelling issue with that. But um, what I use for anything that uh, is going to support my beehives is going to be around the bees, including the boxes now. The boxes behind me, like that one right there, that dark hive is uh, covered with eco wood. So eco wood is just a mineral finish for your wood that's friendly to bees. Lots of beekeepers use it. You can dunk your boxes in it and uh, you will never have your wood rot. Uh, the other thing is, and it comes in a dry pack that's like this big and makes more than five gallons of uh, treatment for your wood. And uh, they just, there are instructions on the pack if it's gonna be in, dry, in ground contact, how long you have to leave it in the Eco wood solution and let it soak in. Uh, I like eco wood a lot. It's working really well. Now let me 
tell you one thing about EcoWood that it does not do is some of the hives that we have, uh, the tops um, that are EcoWood treated. So this top is treated with EcoWood. And if you notice, there are little cracks and splits here. So the EcoWood does not prevent these cracks, but what it does prevent is rot. So they're never gonna rot and get all pulpy and everything, but uh, it also doesn't do a great job of preventing warping. So you can see on the edges here that it warped up just a little bit. So I would recommend, uh, of course, gluing it really well. The joints have to be really good. But uh, when it comes to finishing wood for outdoors, and if it's beehive equipment and you want something safe for your bees, Eco Wood gets my vote. I'm gonna put a link to that down in the video description so you can get it. You can get it from Home Depot, Menards. Uh, all the home centers carry it. So you can also get it on Amazon. So that's what I would treat that with. Any wood, hives themselves too, inside, outside, all the hive components, slatted racks, everything. It's great. You create, I get one of those shallow totes, like people would store clothes in and slide under their bed. And uh, that's what I fill with the eco wood because now whole hive sides and everything else can get right in there. This is a queen excluder right here that you put on the front. That's finished with eco wood as well. Otherwise it would just look like normal pine. So every time it rains on it and dries out, it gets darker. So if you like that look, eco wood. Question number 12. This comes from Alan Salisbury, Wiltshire, UK. It says, last year I purchased two flow hives and put a package of bees in both of them. Deeps only, late summer. I added a medium super for them to build their winter stores. Both hives did this, and so far they're doing well this winter and taking fondant as they need it. So that's a deep with a medium full of honey and then inner cover with fondant on it. Sounds like a great configuration. My question is, assuming they come through and they're strong, uh, what would be my next move? I would hope to add the Flow Super and extract some honey later this year, plus avoid them swarming. So back on the swarming thing, you may not be able to avoid that. But if you can, we want to expand it. So when it comes to the flow hives, I've done lots of videos about this already, so we're retreading it. But uh, you've got the deep box, and by the end of winter, they'll be up into that medium box. So some people rotate their hive boxes. I don't. And that's because uh, they're moving up there, but as I use a single entrance, no top vent, and by the way, the Flow High Design had that figured out when they first came out in 2015. They didn't have any upper venting. They didn't have any upper entrances. They only had the single entrance at the bottom and their venting is through the back, which is also on the bottom in their bottom support system. So it's already closed up nice. So here's what they do in a perfect world. Uh, they're up there already in that medium super. So we've got the deep and the medium and we've got the cover. Warm weather hits, they start to backfill that and they start to move their brood back down towards the entrance. So what you'll have to do is keep an eye on that because you don't want them to swarm. So we don't want them to fill up all of those frames on that medium box. We don't want them to go wall to wall honey, capped honey, and then they're out of space. And then now they're down below with nothing but the brood box and nothing above them. That's when they end up starting to swarm. So once they've started to backfill all of that, and they started to move their brood down. So once their brood is half into that deep box, that's when I would put my flow super on. If you put your flow super on too soon, then they have a tendency not to fill the bottom box as quickly as they otherwise would. And you're probably going to have to use a queen excluder. Now see, for me, where I live, I don't worry that much about the swarming aspect. So I wait them out and I let them fill the bottom frames before I put the flow super on because I don't use queen excluders. And what I do is once that medium box that's sitting on the deep, once that's full of honey again and it's being capped or even just full and even not capped honey, that's when the flow super goes on to give them that added space before they feel honey bound. So then they're also the brood is moving down towards the entrance and this is another advantage by the way of having a small entrance. 
So by small, I mean the flow heights already have a, a reduced entrance. It's three eighths of an inch tall. That's why mice don't get into them. They have an aluminum bottom plate, which is a screen for IPM for the pullout tray from the back. And uh, so they're all set up for that. You can wait them out. But the problem is it's a full width entrance. So Flow Hive came out with an entrance reducer. Aha. Uh -huh. I just thought of this right now. Because they realized that reducing the entrance will cause your bees. They'll be protected right here. But um, uh, it reduces airflow too, which does not make them want to swarm. It makes them want to move their brood closer to the entrance and then they'll backfill it with honey. Where if we leave that entrance wide open because we want to get maximum production out of them, uh, that gives them a lot more ventilation and therefore now they can keep their brood up higher. So we want them to move their brood back. So, and this is also reversible, but this is aluminum, good stuff. Reduce the entrance, get them all back down there. And then once they are there, uh, that's when you can open up the top and put your flow super on it and then hopefully they'll fill everything right back up and no top venting no top entrance i used to do that it didn't work because now it spread brood through the whole thing and even had brood in my flow super uh, but if you use the queen excluder of course your queen's not going to be up in your flow super at all but it's been my experience that they slow production in fact the queen excluder that comes with the flow hive that black plastic one uh, I've had bees propolize that almost completely and create a barrier between the hive and going up into the flow super. So eliminating that, more production, quicker honey flow into those supers, and you're good to go. So I hope that works. That's my configuration. And the good news is, too, I have a video coming up soon. I have my winter version of the flow hive, and I'm going to be showing all the components, how it's insulated, how it's set up, and how I use all flow hive components so I don't have to mix and match with other standard Langstroth boxes, which side to side do not match the flow hive dimensions. They're off by a quarter inch, so that's an eighth inch on either side. Standard Langstroth boxes are wider than the flow hive. But that's what I do, and that's my last question for today. So I want to thank you all for being here and for listening. And hopefully you're going to leave comments down below. And please don't forget to go and visit uh, and see that new hive design. Say hello. Wish him the best. Make your comments about what you see on what you see as problems. Or everybody wants constructive feedback. You know, like uh, tell them what you notice. Find out what's going on. And hopefully we'll get a dialogue going. And you can see if tipping up a, a long lang hive is a solution or if it's just fraught with problems. We don't know. But it never hurts to look into new beehive configurations to see how they're going to go. So that's about it for today. I want to thank you for being here and I hope that your weekend ahead is going to be a fantastic one and that you can do a lot of learning, get your supplies in, and get your bees ordered if you need them for coming spring. Thanks for watching. <music>